My name is Dieter Müller-Dombor. I was born in Germany in a city called Bielefeld. My mother had, in fact, six children. I was the second, born 1925. I had another sister, and then I have uh, three brothers. Nearby our home, we had uh, nice forests, and uh, we <coughs> had also open areas, sloping areas where in the winter we had snow and we were skiing in this area. Important early influences on theater included a grade school teacher and an uncle. You are really lucky as I was to have a grade school teacher whom you could look up to, who was kind to you. You can have certain people who are successful and who are kind to adhere to and to see if they are model for you. It was my uncle who was a forester in Eastern Prussia and very early I was attracted to his professional work because that didn't come about because of the Second World War. I was drafted already into the Hitler Youth, which is a sort of a youth movement that uh, at that time we had no inkling about its po political implication. It was just a youth movement where you are together with many other young people your age, and we went camping. I was a drummer. I was a fanfare player. When I was sort of in the years from 10 to 14, uh, the war started when I was 14 years old. That was 1939, September, when the German army uh, started the war going into Poland. And uh, my dad was drafted right away because he was also in the First World War, an officer, and I accompanied him to the place where they were gathering, and I said to my dad, gee, I wished I could go with you. And he said, my son, I hope you don't have to come to this war. When I was 16, I was asked to be a motorcycle messenger during bombing alarms in my city. I drove around at night when the sirens were howling. Everybody disappeared in the cellar. I was so young and I thought always nothing can happen to me. And when I was 17, I was drafted into the first uh, pre-army and then soon thereafter into the German army. So I was essentially involved uh, for four years in the Second World War. I was lucky to get into American prison camp. I was in one of these uh, open uh, Wiesenlagers, they were called on the left side of the Rhine. Then I was lucky to get out of there after about three weeks and transported to a more permanent camp called Atishi, uh, very close to Paris, where we had tents and so on but the food was very sparse because the Americans had a tremendous task to organize this sudden flood of all these prisoners, you know. I understood that. But that's where I spent my 20th birthday. Since I was wounded, not severely, but somewhat wounded on my legs and head, they released me in September 1945 when I came home and my parents were alive, and my brothers were alive. I was a very lucky person to have that still for me to come home. Following coming back from prison camp, and when the school started again, I had to go nine months back to school to get a senior matriculation, which allows you to go to university if it's working. Not all universities were working in 1948, for example. But then I had this two-year span. I worked practically in agriculture 
in a large stable where I learned milking cows. That was my first uh, exposure. Then I was another place where they were racing horses. I started my agricultural studies in Germany. And that was from 1948 to 51. In 51, I got my degree, a diploma in agricultural engineering. And uh, then when I was finished with that, I couldn't get a job in Germany. It was totally closed off again. So I temporarily uh, got a job as a driver for the American newspaper Stars and Stripes in Stuttgart. Then I found out there was an opportunity for young people, healthy people, to immigrate to Canada. On January 4, 1952. And uh, we went with a big Italian ship across the Atlantic to Halifax, got registered, and then shipped to Vancouver, where I was standing again in a long row of people trying to find work. But uh, my wife at that time uh, found a job very soon as a domestic in a lawyer's family. That got us over the first cliff. People could get a job. They offered me a job in agriculture on, the, on Vancouver Island. I went from Vancouver to Victoria and were picked up by the person who needed help. He had a place in Saanich Peninsula. We were driven out there by him, very nice people, but he had a huge chicken farm, a sort of mass uh, killing of chickens. <laughs> and I should sign a contract for six months. And I just thought for a moment and I said, no, I cannot do that. Killing chickens every day. One day, uh, took another two weeks, a uh, person said, you know, I have a job for you in a sawmill. And uh, I said, that's wonderful. The job I got was uh, to work at a green chain table. The guys who are standing on each side of the table, they have to pull down these uh, boards that are coarsely cut and pile them on piles right away. And sometimes that was pretty hard work. But I was very happy at that time. <laughs> and uh, the, the salary was something like uh, $1.67 an hour. After the sawmill, Dieter worked on a forest inventory project he was able to save enough money to attend the University of British Columbia. In 1955, I got my bachelor's degree in forestry, the BSF degree, Bachelor of Science of Forestry. So that got me into forestry. I felt so happy because in Germany, I never could achieve that. And here I was in Canada, in British Columbia, the nicest forestry country you can imagine with a big Douglas fir, hemlock trees, western red cedar, and so on. Wonderful forestry country. But interestingly enough, most of the guys who studied forestry were concerned with forest engineering, logging, and how to get the big trees out. And I became more interested in the uh, ecological area of how to renew the forest, how to replant it, and how to uh, get it back, you know, after logging. When I got my bachelor's degree, there was a professor. Again, I was so lucky to get this one. He was a Czech person. He was very critical to me at first because I was a German. And the Czechs had suffered under the German occupation. His name was Vladimir J. Kraina. He persuaded me to do a PhD. And I did that on Vancouver Island and uh, three years. And in uh, 1958, I was quite finished and uh, I got a job, several job offers. That was hurrah. <laughs> I never had that before. I took the one that was uh, most to my liking, and that was in Winnipeg, Manitoba. I was warned, boy, you are getting into a climate that's Siberia. 
And I said, that doesn't really matter, but I can get involved in false land classification. And it was exactly what I liked. Being like Siberia, about six months frozen in, you know, very hot summers with mosquitoes and black flies, that's Winnipeg. And, but I had wonderful work there. I did uh, experimentations with, uh, in the greenhouse, so I was also in the winter occupied. Uh, in the summer, we always left with trailers and uh, did our field work outside. So I was a regular forest research officer for five years. During that time, we had our first children. My first daughter was born in 55, just when I got my bachelor's degree in forest science. And then I had a son born in 56. My other daughter, Julia, was born, three kids were born while I was a graduate student. And then we moved with these three children to Winnipeg, Manitoba, where I got into the Department of Forestry, had a proper, regular job, fairly good paid, and we could uh, actually buy a house in Winnipeg. Two more children came, uh, two more boys, so I had five children. In 1963, I got a call from the University of Hawaii, UH Manoa, if I was interested to come to Hawaii to teach botany. And I thought, my gosh, this sounds attractive. And when I wrote the letter, yes, I would be interested. And I thought, gee, that's a real challenge. I was a little bit afraid because I didn't know anything about uh, tropical plants and that would be a whole bunch of new things to learn. I flew with my wife and children from Vancouver to Honolulu. And there was a whole department standing there, Max Doty, Gladys Baker, Charlie Lamoureux, uh, I remember Bruce Coyle, uh, faculty people, and received us. That was very nice. Amazing aloha from the faculty of botany at University of Hawaii. And then we were in a hotel in Waikiki for about a week and I was looking through the newspapers where we could perhaps find a place to rent. Nothing in Manoa Valley. Nobody wanted a family with five kids. We found a place in Kailua. Kailua Beach, there were a few houses there uh, just towards Lanikai, which uh, later Mayor Farsi all removed and made a beach park out of it. But at that time, we got a house there, could rent it for $220 a month. Wonderful. I got loaded with teaching introductory botany and also asked to develop a program in ecology because I didn't have an ecologist. It was a lot of work. And then in the second semester, they gave me another course to teach. That was plant evolution. And Charlie Lamo <laughs> gave me his notes. He had uh, taught that course before and gave me some help. And uh, I had to work so hard, I was just one lecture ahead of the students. Then all of a sudden, after two, three years, I got messages that I had to leave the US because they let me in with a so-called J visa. It said, you have to leave for two years. I was then first in Göttingen. I had to get my two oldest children with me. My wife was allowed to stay here another month. And uh, when that worked out with Sri Lanka, at the time called Ceylon, she came directly to Ceylon, to Colombo, and we were reunited in the spring of uh, 1967, left everything here in Sri Lanka. I was uh, to do the administration of a new book, uh, revision of the classical flora of Ceylon, tropical flora. 
So how this Smithsonian project came about was to Dr. Raymond Fosberg, who was a graduate of the Botany Department of UH Manoa. He was a senior member of the Smithsonian Institute of Botany. He is known as the Pacific Botanist. He offered me that job in Sri Lanka. And what that involved was he was getting uh, systematists, taxonomists, for different groups of plants to come out for stretches like three months at a time. And I had to accommodate them, go out with them, got them help from graduate students of the University of Pardinia. And then I was allowed to do an own project there. And that project was the ecology project. I was also teaching at the University of Peradenia in Kendi at that time. And through that, I got graduate students to work with me in the field. I mapped two national parks, the vegetation of Kuhuna National Park and Wilpatu National Park. I did a vegetation map and published several papers <coughs> in Sri Lanka. Then there was a team of Smithsonian mammologists, and we joined. And so we did a combined animal-plant operation in research. In 69, my time to be outside the US was coming to an end. I had another stint of three months in Göttingen on the way back from Sri Lanka when I started to do this textbook with Professor Ellenberg, who was my sponsor there. Ellenberg was a guiding person for me, a model, and a Forsberg also, because he vouched for me and said, you know, take that person, hold on to him. And uh, the faculty wanted me back. Dieter discusses his role as a director of the International Biological Program, Hawaii. Soon thereafter, there was a major international program starting, the International Biological Program. Not only one person could do it, but a cooperation among scientists. That was the whole purpose of the International Biological Program, because there was a major complaint that scientists are always working alone and not connecting. So I was then uh, given the task to, uh, first of all, rewrite that proposal. We got it funded in 1971, and I became the director and scientific coordinator. We had 50 people working on that, 25 established scientists, senior also, and 25 graduate students, a number of young people who are now active. Dieter Mueller-Dumbois is uh, a person I very much respect and, and of whom I am very fond. So I got to know him better after I finished my PhD and uh, came back to University of Hawaii because he was the principal investigator of the International Biological Project. So he orchestrated everything and uh, did some really wonderful work characterizing the ecosystems uh, on in the Hawaiian Islands, which are a, sort of a, the epitome of examples of what sorts of ecological and evolutionary processes take place on islands. All these organisms were studied along the Mauna Loa Transect, and then it had to be brought together in form of a synthesis, and I did that in form of a book eventually. We finished it successfully and got it published in 1981. While leading the International Biological Program, Dieter observed dramatic changes occurring in some of the Ohia Lehua forests on Hawaii Island. When I got that funding in 1971 and uh, I invited a number of people who wanted to participate in the IBP, um, I had a group of about 20 colleagues and I let them 
on a field trip going up the saddle road and I had discovered before that there was a patch of forest dying, native forest. And uh, we were all walking in there looking around, gee, what's going on here? These trees are dying. I had seen that before. Is there something really major happening? It was hard to believe. This rapid spread of direct which actually supported very much the disease hypothesis there must be a disease you know if trees are dying so quickly across the area and i still was very skeptical about that and for 10 years it was investigated very slowly this uh, sequence of pathologists forest pathologists also coming from the mainland so i had a group of people Jim Jacobi and two students that I had brought from Sri Lanka. One was Balakrishna, and the other one was Ranjit Kuri, and they helped me in this uh, dieback research. Uh, first, we think of disease. Secondly, we think of some environmental perturbations. Environmental, uh, like for example, too much water coming down, too rainy, or too, too prolonged dryness. And the third factor, which we didn't consider at first is the population itself, the trees. Finally, it dawned on us that there may be something we hadn't thought about. It. And that was that many of the forests who were dying were actually old age forests that were in a life stage where the trees were barely holding on to life. The trees have a life cycle like human beings. They get born as seedlings. First of all, they are seeds, and they get born. They are little ones, little creatures. They are very sensitive at that time. But what we found under the direct sense, they were all there, the seedlings. Why didn't they die when the canopy trees are dying? You know, that was sort of the first thought. And the younger, when we saw younger stands, they were doing fine. And uh, so it came finally out that uh, the third factor is a major factor in the dieback phenomena. And this phenomenon actually turned out to occur in different kinds of ecosystems all over the world when people started looking. Uh, so that was a, a huge contribution to plant ecology, plant community ecology. Uh, he called this phenomenon cohort senescence because the trees were all in the same cohort and they were all getting old together. and. Uh, so when things became stressful, they all tended to die at the same time. The reason I came here was to work with him and to study the uh, dynamics of Ohia forests on the Big Island. Dieter took sort of European tradition of forest ecology and a North American tradition of forest ecology and kind of found common ground between them. And he published a book in 1973 called Aims and Methods of Vegetation Ecology. And that book is very widely cited as a real sort of foundational classic in plant ecology. Dieter is also a person who has had a tremendous influence encouraging uh, botanical science in the world, but especially in the Pacific Basin. He's been very active in the Pacific Science Congress he brings people together all the time to talk about plant community ecology. There have been a number of scientific conferences in Hawaii in the past 20, 30 years, and Dieter usually would run a symposium in which uh, a bunch of people would give talks on a particular theme, and then he would have a one, two, three, four, f even five to seven day long field trip that would go often to multiple islands and see uh, many different Hawaiian ecosystems. Those were always sort of very well attended and I think very much appreciated by the people who used to come from all around the world to these conferences. Well, he was a good scientist, but he was also a very kind person. And if someone was having a hard time, you could be sure that he would step in and help them out. Dieter shares some final thoughts. So happy people usually are those who have been working hard to develop their talents no matter what level you reach in your life, it doesn't really matter so much, but what you can do properly and do it responsibly and helping others with it, that's 
in my opinion, the purpose of life.